Hello everybody and welcome to another Cyber Lounge webinar. Um, we're joined by Akash Patel from West Point and Ravi Dev uh, Devarasetti, sorry about that, who's a cloud security engineer. Um, Ravi is recently or is about to publish a book, is that correct? Or is it already published? Sorry. Yes, it was already published. It came out uh, June 11th. Okay, yeah. Um, and he's just going to talk us through a bit of a uh, Zscaler. And um, yeah, so everyone who's in who's uh, watching now, uh, be sure to get your questions down below um, or in the comment section rather. And uh, as, soon, as soon as the presentation is finished, we'll get to them. Okay. So Ravi, without further ado, it's over to you. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Akash. Thank you for uh, West Point uh, recruitment uh, for uh, providing me this opportunity. This is my first time doing this. So pardon me if I make any mistakes or if I sound nervous, which I am a little bit. So today um, we're going to talk about the Zscaler cloud security product. Um, again, the book that I wrote was for the ZIA, which is Zscaler Internet Access, and ZPA, which is Zscaler Private Access, which are the two most important products uh, that uh, drive the Zscaler's revenue. Now, what was the motivation for writing this book? That is always important. What am I trying to achieve here? Uh, so when the publisher contacted me, I thought about this. I talked to my family because this was my first time writing a book. And they said it will be a good um, thing for the cybersecurity community, uh, even if I give up in the middle, but at least I gave it a shot. So then it was a few uh, months of you know, weekend writing because I do a day job as a cloud security engineer. Um, so I wanted to write a book for anyone who wants to transition into cybersecurity, which is how I did. I was in network operations and then I transitioned into Zscaler cybersecurity. It wasn't easy, but uh, my managers and mentors at the time had, uh, gave me an opportunity. So this book is geared towards the IT professionals who have been in general network operations or help desk support or PC support or on-premises servers, et cetera. We are trying to give them a pathway into cybersecurity from the Zscaler perspective. So that is the primary audience for this book, right? The second reason would be when executives like cybersecurity executives are trying to make a decision on which secure web gateway they want to purchase. They usually do a proof of concept. They talk to sales. They talk to all these people and then get a rough idea of which product would suit their needs. But it's always a difficult issue when it comes from migrating from a current uh, end of life security product into a new security product. So this actually lays down the exact steps that needs that need to be taken so that you can transition from an existing uh, end of life or you know uh, end of end of life shelf uh, security product into zscaler so this tells them okay these are the people i need this is the time frame i'm looking at so it it gives them an idea of how difficult it's going to be because the last thing a cybersecurity manager or a professional wants to do is to end up with a failed project. The third one is geared for people who are already using Zscaler. So how can they optimize their solution? What are the different reports that they can use that gives them insight into their operations and then use it in the best way possible to improve their security posture and also troubleshoot it more efficiently? Because when a new product is rolled out, the end users are, are all like, ah, this is another security product, it's gonna make our life miserable. So you don't want that bad user experience. So that's why this book is gonna give more tips about how to troubleshoot this, how to sectionalize the troubleshooting and so on. So that is that was the motivation for my book. So let's uh, step into the book itself, right? So what exactly is Zscaler? Now Zscaler is a cloud-based security product. It is not something that you would purchase in the market 
bring it to your data center, install it, and operate it. Now, there are certain components of Zscaler that need that kind of a setup if it's optional uh, based on the enterprise's needs, but everything is set in the cloud itself. All you have to do is send your traffic to them, let them handle it, and then everything comes back clean or gets to the destination as it's promised. So let's um, get into the main products for um, the Zscaler. We talked about Zscaler internet access and Zscaler private access. So if you look at the Zscaler internet access, everybody today uses the internet whether it's for a Google search or a company that's running a marketing campaign on YouTube, or if they are on Facebook or Instagram, Twitter, and so on, the employees of the organization need to access the internet to do their job. And many of the applications nowadays, such as Office 365 or Box.com and everything, they are also based on the internet. So internet has become an integral part of our life. but we all know what happens when you connect the your infrastructure to the internet we are not too far away from the colonial pipeline hack we are not too far away from the kaseya hack and we are seeing the white house taking steps to um, improve the cybersecurity posture so internet is the wild wild west today um, that is why as a personal user, you have an endpoint protection. Maybe you have Mac McAfee antivirus or some kind of bit defender or something like that. But for an enterprise, these small um, products or these features are not enough. En enterprises work with third party organizations, they work with uh, different vendors, etc. So they need to have a much robust product especially an enterprise-grade product that provides a lot of reliability and SLAs, et cetera, so that there is high availability and so on. So the book starts off with um, the premise of why Zscaler is needed now. Um, well, there are multiple reasons. Pandemic has definitely accelerated this because everybody wants to work from home now. They don't want to put their families at risk. They don't want to come into the office and risk infecting others and so on. Uh, and Zscaler is enabling that. So Zscaler says that, okay, you can migrate to our service very easily. And then now you can have all your workforce remote, but they can still use the same solution when they come into the office. There is no, um, you know, uh, you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So that is why um, the enterprises are now moving towards this security products. So from an internet access perspective, it's basic stuff. The user requests an internet resource, then the resource, uh, the request goes to Zscaler. Zscaler does all the checks and balances, checks if it's a malicious website, if there is a cross-site scripting, et cetera, and then filters it and sends it back. So Zscaler uh, cloud architecture is very modular and very uh, everything is in the cloud. So they have something called as the central authority, which is like the brains, like the CPU of the operations. That's where the enterprise configures all of its configuration, like how many users, how will they authenticate, how will the traffic get there, all the configuration that is needed to run the operations. Then you have something called as the public service edge. Now, this used to be called a Zscaler enforcement node, Zen nodes. Many people are familiar with those. They still use that interchangeably. Those are your worker nodes. So the worker nodes, they get instructions from the central authority. They say, is this user authorized to access this website in this way? That's it. And if, they, if, if it's yes, then they will process it. If it's no, they'll just deny it. So they are just the worker nodes. They have no idea about what other world is out there they just do what they what they are told the third one is called the nanolog streaming service so now the logs are absolutely critical in a security organization we've all talked about the sims and artificial intelligence and machine learning and all these algorithms but all of those work only when you have logs so these logs are transmitted from their nanolog server which are also obfuscated and encrypted and everything. When they arrive at the customer location, they are decrypted and then decompressed. 
So it's highly scalable as well. And the fourth component, although it's an optional component, is a cloud sandbox. Now, how do we prevent zero day attacks? Now, if you have a signature that is already known for a malicious program, you can easily do a search on it or a hash comparison and then make sure that it's um, um, quarantined or cleaned up. But what happens if it's a zero day, day attack? Well, that's where the sandbox comes into the picture. If um, an enterprise employee is downloading something that Zscaler has never seen before, and the sandbox setting is set to scan the first time. So when the enterprise employee is trying to download that file or software from an untrusted source, um, accidentally or unknowingly or ignorantly, it could be any one of those scenarios, it does not matter. The cloud sandbox says, this is a new signature. Uh, do you mind holding five minutes? Let me detonate this in my cloud sandbox. This is all integrated. The user just gets a message, please wait while your uh, file is being scanned, right? And then five minutes later or 10 minutes later, it all depends on the size of the file and the complexity, et cetera. It either says, this is a malicious one, so I'm gonna block it for you. If it's not malicious, then it says, here is the download link, proceed to download and the download will start, right? Now, why do you think this is a big issue? Because it's the zero day attack. Uh, this is the zero day virus, right? Uh, once that is known, Zscaler propagates that information in real time, like probably in the order of minutes to all of its cloud environments and all the other customers now have that protection without you having to go and say, hey, update my antivirus definitions every 24 hours. This is like in minutes, in real time. And this is the power of that cloud sandbox that we talked about. So these are the four components. Now Zscaler has their own data centers and just like AWS or Amazon or Google Cloud Platform, they, they have um, all these redundancy, resiliency, high availability, everything is in place. Each of this component, the central authority, public service edge, nanolog streaming service and sandbox, they are all highly available and they have component level redundancy, they have power redundancy, they have um, architecture redundancy and even data center redundancy. So they have all of these things. So that's good, right? Now we know what are the components of the Zscaler um, uh, architecture. Now comes the migration process. This is where many of the professionals have trouble wrapping their head around it. How do I migrate? Where do I start, right? So that is where the Zscaler, they call it Deployment Advisory Service, DAS, now, called, now it's called Professional Services, but you don't have to go to Zscaler and um, sign up for an associate for this procedure. They put it out there on the internet, the link is in the book. You go there, it walks you through each step of the migration. It asks you, what, what kind of equipment do you have? How many users do you have? What does your current secure web gateway look like? Uh, why are you migrating? Um, what is important to you? Is it user count, the features, what kind of features and so on? It walks you through the whole thing and we have made sure that we put that all that process just in one chapter. We just dedicated one full chapter to it. It's not only important to know what you are clicking it's also important why you're clicking it, right? When you say you want SSL inspection, why do you need it? Does your industry need it or do you're doing it because it's a best practice? And do you have the equipment necessary to do it? But primarily we look at two things. One is the traffic forwarding. How are the users gonna send the traffic to Zscaler? And the second one is called um, authentication so how are users going to authenticate because if users don't authenticate um, you cannot apply your policies to them right so if you are authenticating as a ceo then you have a different set of policies if you are authenticating as somebody from social media organization within the company then you have access to facebook twitter and so on but if you're accessing as um, say a janitor or some kind of support personnel or 
some kind of you know um, a receptionist or somebody they don't really need to have access to all these cloud applications right so you can segment it based on the user so zscaler supports um, a few types of traffic forwarding some of the most popular ones that is uh, the, the one that zscaler recommends is the gre the general routing encapsulation GRE tunnels, they, you just create the tunnels into the Zscaler data center, and then you just forward the traffic, and that's it. Zscaler takes care of it. Now, for redundancy purposes, it's always recommended you have a primary um, tunnel and a secondary tunnel, because if your primary internet were to go down, then your users will be totally down. They will not have protection. So Zscaler recommends at least two tunnels, but that doesn't limit it to two tunnels. You could have two tunnels per router. You could have two routers in a data center, and then you could have two data centers. So basically, you have eight tunnels. Now, that could sound like overkill, but again, it all depends on the um, needs of the organization. So that is the traffic forwarding with G GRE tunnels. The next one is the IPsec tunnels. We all know IPsec is a secure IP. It's the encrypted version of the tunnels. Now, if the organization really wants everything to be encrypted, then they could do that as well. They could use the IPsec tunnels. But be aware, because of the encryption involved, your throughput might be reduced. So you, you, you need to be ready for that. The third one is the pack files, uh, proxy auto forwarding. We, we've all used proxy um, I mean pack files in our browsers. So the browser can tell um, Zscaler, this is exactly what I want to do based on the destination, based on the user. And the pack files are actually dynamic pack files. You could host them on the Zscaler cloud so that you have redundancy and scalability. Um, and you, you this kind of gives you some macros where you can say primary data center and secondary data center, and it's not hard coded. So if a user is coming into the US region, it automatically um, uh, translates those macros, macros into the nearest data centers for you. So you don't have to worry about how the data centers are gonna pick. If you come in through Asia Pacific, it, it automatically figures out which data center to use. The last one is the ZCC. It used to be called the Z app, which is the Zscaler client connector. It's very similar to your Cisco AnyConnect VPN client or your Juno Secure Pulse. You just have an application that is running on your computer, which users can authenticate for both ZIA and ZPA. And then the traffic uh, goes to the app, uh, the Zscaler client connector, and the client connector takes care of the magic in the back end. So, um, the, the users have a nice little app that they can see what's going on. So once the traffic gets to the nodes, which is the Zscaler PSC, the public service edges, well, they have to authenticate, right? Uh, if authentication is not there, there are two downfalls. One, you cannot apply policies at a granular level. So if you want to apply policies based on the user's, um, what do you call it, uh, job description, job title, department, location, because see, if a user is coming in from United States, the policies are different, but if they are coming in from Europe, they could be very drastically different because of the GDPR and all those uh, European regulations, right? So that is one reason. The second reason is when it comes to billing, everybody wants to spend less money on the Zscaler platform, right, on any product. So if you are authenticated, then it is counted as one user license. But if you are not, Zscaler is going to take, say, 250 transactions per day as one user. So if you have a very chatty site, you could be paying more money than necessary if authentication is not in place. So that is why many companies do prefer authentication. Now, if it's a small company, you don't have the um, uh, resources in terms of people to stand up an LDAP server, maintain it, and you know, SAML authentication, uh, integrating with Okta, ping identity, etc. Zscaler offers a pretty neat solution. It's called the hosted database. So you just go into the Zscaler portal, put in your name, 
first name, last name, user ID, password, just hit submit, that's it. The user now resides in there. So when the user goes to authenticate, it checks against that database. It's a static database. You, know, you could call it an Excel file or something like that. Um, and you could also do a multiple user uh, configuration by using an Excel formatted file that you can download from Zscaler. You can add 50 users at once, 100 users at once, change the users, et cetera. You know, add, modify, delete. Now that is recommended only if you have maybe 25 to 100 employees, because obviously if you have 50,000 employees, you're not gonna do that all day. It's, it's gonna be a nightmare, right? That there are typos that could happen. You could have inadvertent mistakes that could creep in. So if you are a cloud startup, for example, if you have 25 employees, 50 employees, mom and pop's, pop store, go for hosted DB. It's pretty secure. Everything is HTTPS encrypted and so on. Now, next comes the LDAP um, mechanism, right? It's very common for companies to have Active Directory and use that Active Directory to authenticate the user locally and then give them access into the uh, Zscaler platform. The third one is SAML, Security Assertion Markup Language. We've all used them at some point of time. So where the company integrates with a third party like Ping Identity, Okta, et cetera. The fourth one is very uncommon. We usually don't see that. Uh, it has kind of many limitations. It uses the Windows Kerberos system. So that's the authentication system where it issues tickets and all those things. So once you've determined how many um, locations that you're gonna send the traffic from, what are the what is the authentication mechanism, now you go and procure all that equipment, right? You need all those routers, you have those ISP circuits, you need the firewalls, ports opened and so on. The next one is the features. Well, what are the features that are offered? Well, obviously you have malware protection, which is botnet, viruses, um, worms, all those kinds of um, bad stuff. Then you have sandbox, which is optional. Again, you can use the sandbox. Then you have browser control. So now browsers, we all know, as they get older, they have more vulnerabilities on them. And if the organization is not doing proper browser control, then you could be exposing those users running the outdated browsers to threats in the cloud. Right? So you could actually limit what kind of browsers users can use to get into um, Zscaler. The next one is access control. That's the broad category that, say, that says, hey, are you allowed to uh, access streaming applications like YouTube, Pandora, um, Instagram, not Instagram, but other ones. I'm not very familiar with them. Then social media. So are you allowed to use LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, all those things, right? Because nowadays people post uh, innocent pictures, but that could be turned around by hackers. They could say, oh, the date of birth or your uh, name of your pet or name of your children. And they could create some kind of, then they say, hey, today is my birthday. And then they could reverse engineer all this stuff. So social media has also become an unfortunate place where credentials could be leaked. So that is the cloud app control. So it, it can actually categorize what type of applications and then put a, a limit there. And then you have file type control if you are using some kind of weird file um, in, um, extensions which are insecure, like macros enabled, et cetera, et cetera. You could limit those as well. And one of the very neat features, which is not a security control, but it's the bandwidth control. Now, all these companies have limited bandwidth. Now, they, they could have 100 megabits per, per, per second connection. Some could have just a T1 connection, which is 1.5 meg per second. Bandwidth is extremely um, um, precious it has to be managed very carefully. So you don't want to buy another product for your bandwidth control. You could actually implement bandwidth control in um, Zscaler. The other part is DLP, data loss prevention. We've seen that happen multiple times over and over. So DLP protection, uh, Zscaler offers some dictionaries that can actually look for numbers that are like social security numbers, credit card numbers or health information numbers like ID numbers based on Canada, Australia, 
uh, Europe, uh, United States, all of those markets. It gives you some pre, uh, um, predefined dictionaries that can be used out of the box, literally speaking. You could also integrate it with the third party um, DLP solution, which is up to the up to the enterprise. Then mobile devices, right? Bring your own device is a big deal. People use tablets, phones all the time. I personally use tablets quite a bit. I don't even boot up my computer unless it's like um, something I have to do on a computer. Uh, so that has gained extreme popularity and mobile devices have issues of their own. So you have um, malware on mobile platforms, you have jailbreak devices, um, you have non-standard devices. So Zscaler can even help protect those because attack surface can come in from anywhere, laptops, desktops, even mobile devices. Zscaler offer, also offers a basic firewall. Um, you could define certain firewall rules, which is pretty decent. So now once you have set up all of these, for example, you understood how to forward the traffic, how to authenticate, how many locations, uh, what is the mechanism used um, for deploying the features, what features do you want? That is when you come together, you bring all the teams together, you start migrating a few pilot users onto that platform, you test out all your applications, your business applications, make sure there are no issues. Uh, one of the most important issues that I've seen or most common issues I've seen is URL categorization. So not all vendors have URLs that are maintained to the highest standard. So Zscaler can inadvertently say, this is a malicious URL and we've had so many issues like that. So you want to check those out Tell Zscaler, hey, this is not a malicious URL. This is our vendor URL. I mean, unfortunately, they don't use the highest standards, but we want you to whitelist it, right? We don't want you to blacklist it. So those are the minor things that you uh, figure it out using the pilot users who are usually friendly users who are working with you to figure out the platform. Once it's been two weeks or a month, it all depends on the enterprise everything looks good, then you start transitioning more users on there in a, in a um, staggered fashion. You don't want the whole site of your headquarters transition to Zscaler and then end up with 20,000 tickets in the, uh, in the ne very next day, right? That is not what you want. Once the whole transition is done, that is when you transition it to operations. So the 24 seven SOC will start looking at the insights, it will start looking at any botnet callbacks. It will start looking at anything that says, hey, this user's computer could be infected. We are seeing unusual behavior and so on. That is when your dashboards come into the picture. Zscaler offers absolute customization of dashboards to the very nitty gritty level. You could go down to the a single PC level to see what is going on. So this was the whole transition process for the ZIA, which is the Zscaler Internet Access. The ZPA is very similar. Now, it's not like Zscaler has different data centers for ZIA and different data centers for ZPA. That's like saying AWS has different um, data centers, one for S3, one for EC2, one for Redshift. It doesn't work that way. It's the same. Um, data center that supports multiple features or multiple products. In the same way, Zscaler has uh, multiple products that are supported out of the same data center. But the terminology is a little different. You still have the central authority in ZPA, which holds the main configuration. You still have the PSCs, the uh, public service edges, which are the which are the worker nodes that that do the hard hardcore work um, that is needed. You still have the log streaming service. It's called Nanolog streaming service in ZIA. It's called log streaming service in ZPA. It's just a little different. Then you have um, additional um, products or additional devices that are called Zscaler app connectors. So I'll come to that in a bit. So why do you need uh, ZPA? What does ZPA do? Why is it different from ZIA? So zero trust network access is gaining a lot of popularity. In the past, you would segment your network based on your um, networking. You would say untrusted network, trusted network, but here's the deal. 
when a hacker gets into your trusted network, what is preventing the bad actor from traversing the east-west side? So lateral transition among, among the applications. So they could have access to um, all the devices, which could be 100, 200, 500, everything that's on the network. So that is no longer um, safe way of doing things. There is a better way of doing things, right? So what if I say that Ravi is allowed to access salesforce.com only as a read only? So it does not matter where Ravi comes in, whether he comes from, from a trusted network, untrusted network, as long as he's authenticated, he can only access Salesforce. Now, there is no longer a network connection. Ravi, Ravi does not have uh, access to the network, but he only access uh, has access to the salesforce.com application in a read-only capacity. That's it. You try to move out of that lateral um, connection, you will not be able to move at all. So that is the granular level of access that ZPA offers. Now, how do you make it happen? Very simple. You have your applications, which are the destination. Then you have the users who are the source. How do you connect these two? You need a broker mechanism, like a brokerage in between, right? So the applications, when they boot up, they, they tell the app connector, it's called the application connector. It's a small virtual machine that's sitting right beside the applications. And it says, Hey, I am the salesforce.com application. I'm available. Hey, I am the Jira ticketing system. I am available. So they register with the app connect, just like you register with an unemployment agency, right? So you register with them. Then Zscaler Cloud now knows, okay, for Enterprise ABC, I have these 15 applications that are ready to go. Then the users boot up. They say, Easy scaler, I want to access my Office 365 or Salesforce.com application. So when they come in, Zscaler is the broker in between. Zscaler says, is the user allowed to access Salesforce.com? Yes, the central authority says yes, he is authority, he's allowed. So then it checks what is the nearest group of applications or nearest group of servers for that user. Then it says, hey, app connector, you are up. You, I will connect you to this user, X, Y, Z. So the user now connects to the application. And a secure tunnel is formed just between that user's Zscaler client connector application and the salesforce.com server. The user cannot access any other applications that are residing on the same network as salesforce.com servers. You could have um, Jira ticketing system, Confluence, et cetera, but the user cannot access it unless he creates another secure tunnel to that application. So it's a one-to-one -one correlation. It, and here's the best part. Since everything goes to Zscaler and through Zscaler through an encrypted connection, Zscaler uses uh, RFC, I forget what that RFC number is, but it uses the 100.64.0.0 slash X network, which is non-routable on the internet. So it is not a public IP range. So when you have such an IP address, there is no public IP address. So even if a bad actor were to look at it, it's not even exposed to the internet and you cannot attack what you cannot see. So this is the beauty of it. It's, it's, it's as if you don't have to get on the highway when you are ready to drive your car, there is a tunnel that is laid from you to your office cube where you don't have to touch anything else. You're directly uh, flowing into your cube. It's similar to that uh, um, movie, the, um, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, right? So when the guy goes there, he just jumps into that pod and directly slides into his desk. So that's that's the kind of Zscaler mechanism, if you will, right? So that is how ZPA works. Now, migration process is very similar. Um, there is no traffic forwarding here in, 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 in one sense because everything is through the client connector, which establishes your tunnels. There are certain, like a ZPA browser access where you can only access web applications through ZPA, but it's a very 
corner case. I wouldn't recommend that. I would recommend ZPA um, through the Zscaler client connector access, right? Now, the migration process is the same. You identify the pilot users, you identify the applications, um, stand up the servers. Hopefully, you have two servers or two, two um, redundancy on your enterprise side. Zscaler already has the redundancy. It's just on your enterprise side that you need to make sure that you have redundant servers and so on. Now, once you've deployed it, you've migrated it, that's when you hand it off to operations and operations will take care of any other you know, minor changes, troubleshooting. The most common issue that we see with ZPA is the mapping mechanism. Uh, companies don't have the access, um, they, they don't have the principle of least privilege access put down yet. They just say, okay, Ravi comes in, we're going to give him access to this um, 10 servers, whether he needs it or not, that's it. And then when the time comes to revisit, then they say, hey, we are trying to map these access policies for ZPA. Well, guess what? Now you say every, everybody has access to everything. What is the point of ZPA? There is no point. So this is something new Zscaler came out with. Uh, and you know, after, as I was writing the book, this was released after the book. So that's why it's not in the book. But this is just an FYI for anybody who's looking into it. It's called Zscaler Workload Segmentation. So the way I understand it is, again, I could be wrong, but I haven't, I haven't worked in it. I haven't dug deep into it. It basically sits in between your applications and users. And as um, the users start accessing these applications, it's gonna say, well, Ravi has access to these 10 servers, but he's accessed only these two in the past 90 days. So why does he need access to those rest of the eight servers? So let me limit his access to only those two servers. So it's actually paring it down automatically for you without you having to do anything. So this is called Zscaler workload segmentation, which is becoming very popular now because this is like a discovery and deployment mechanism all in one. Um, so these are some of the um, highlights that I wanted to bring out uh, in the book. Uh, and I tried to make it as simple as possible. I'm not trying to insult the intelligence of the reader, but I don't want them to be um, um, afraid saying that, oh, maybe this is not for me. I want to try to lower that bar of learning for them. Um, again, my motivation primarily is to bring people into the fold of cybersecurity. We all know the bad actors are leveling up their game over and over again. And you at Cyber, um, West Point Cybersecurity Recruiting, you know how difficult it is to find candidates, qualified candidates. So this is a very small step in the direction, very small drop in the bucket. I don't expect to become a millionaire from this book and I, that is not the intent either. But I want more people to come into Zscaler. It doesn't have to be Zscaler. You could go into Netscope, you could go into McAfee, it doesn't matter. But the point is I'm trying to make this simple for people who want to transition into cybersecurity. So that is what, uh, all I wanted to present. And um, I can turn it over to the uh, viewers for any questions or Akash yourself um, for any questions. Oscar, welcome back. You're on mute. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, like like Ravi was saying, uh, anyone who still has questions, um, please put them uh, in the comments in LinkedIn. I will read them out. For now, uh, we do have some. Uh, how does Zscaler compare to other uh, cloud security? Um, yeah. Uh, services. So, uh, Sorry. Yes. Um, so I have not had a chance to work with many other um, competing products at the same level of depth with Zscaler, but I was involved in migrating from certain products such as a blue code proxy to Zscaler or McAfee uh, or Semantic has a similar product to, uh, to Zscaler. What I've seen with Zscaler is not so much the product is so different, but the attitude of the company is very different. When I used to work with uh, Zscaler as part of cybersecurity in AT&T, we used to manage multiple customers. 
and the other vendors they were like well this is what we have take it or leave it kind of attitude all they'll say oh yeah it's on our roadmap and six months later nothing but zscaler is not like that when they look at an issue they say yes this could benefit our customers or increasing the limit of this url filtering etc they take a common sense approach and then they say yes we put this on the product roadmap and they listen to us as mssps because we manage multiple clients so that is the back and forth mechanism that makes the product a better one because you are now taking the input of your customers and then incorporating them into the product maybe not overnight obviously but maybe in two or three months or six months roadmap you're keeping a track of it you're updating your customers your partners and so on so that is the attitude that i've seen and the product it is as it is it is a solid product i have i have seen errors made from people perspective because a process was missing but not because the product was defective so the product is solid and um, um, the attitude of the company where it has a good feedback loop between the customer and uh, um, themselves that is what i have seen to be very flexible and they take a common sense approach if you have 25000 urls that you need to categorize they'll say hey why do you need to categorize yourself why don't you go by saying this is social media this is um, business productivity productivity application this is streaming application and so on they have this common sense approach so that people don't have to deal with scalability problems okay and uh we have another question just come in uh, from vignesh um how does zscaler handle day zero vulnerabilities yes day zero vulnerabilities we were talking about the cloud sandbox whereby when a user tries to download a file or any application etc uh, the file is actually intercepted by zscaler zscaler offers different um, configuration options you could ignore sandbox as well which i don't get it why people do that but zscaler intercepts it takes it to its cloud sandbox which is highly available detonates it figures out if there is malicious behavior if it does it blocks it right away and tells the user sorry your um, download was blocked because we detected a malicious signature and then it immediately propagates that signature to entire cloud and zscaler has multiple clouds zscaler 1 2 3 they're running out of spaces right um it it propagates it in real time within minutes probably 5 10 20 minutes to all of the cloud so that any other user who tries to download the same signature will be immediately blocked it won't be sent to the sandbox again now it's a detected vulnerability it immediately blocks it and zscaler has some documentation on their website some marketing material where they've actually documented this happening um i've got a question for you oh, go ahead yeah um so first of all thank you so much for that fantastic insight into zscaler uh, i'm sure it's going to be quite valuable for anyone that is interested in that um so i had a question written down so what is the biggest limitation with zscaler from your personal experience the limitation that they're running into is capacity issues um okay. the just like AT&T back in the day when i was working at AT&T they used to say 4 3G 4G 5G long term evolution right the data is increasing by 1000% that is coming through the AT&T network so mm-hmm. what do you do you need add more capacity but are you keeping up with capacity probably not right that's why you see dropped calls you see connection drops and slow streaming etc zscaler has the same limitation right zscaler is um, running into limitations on their capacity i personally know one of the operations managers who works here out of rally is a good friend of mine we went for lunch together we we talked I talked together quite a bit when I was at AT&T he said ravi i cannot keep up with the demand because if it's a non us country such as argentina brazil um south africa um, asia 
you don't have the same infrastructure that you have like in United States or European Union, right? Or London or UK. You have to go through customs. You have to go through um, to find qualified personnel. They have to load it right, right? If you if you make a mistake, you could bring the cloud down. Uh, you could cause outages. So he has to plan every day, not every month or every year. No, no, Akash. They have to do this six months ahead of the cycle. They have to anticipate the uh, pain points and then deploy and uh, plan for that equipment to arrive in time. So that is one of the most common limitations. Customer will call in, hey, my Zscaler is slow. Well, guess what? That node is experiencing capacity problems. So, you know, my, my, my friend at Zscaler would give me, Ravi, use this IP. We are not giving this to anybody else. Just use this for now for at and So we'll ask the customer, hey, can we transition your tunnel to that virtual IP? So it's that practical limitation. And you always have some issues when interworking with other products. So other products could do this, and then customers would say, I want the same thing. But then Zscal is telling you, dude, that's really not the right way to go. This is the more common sense approach. Try this way. And many customers will say, ah, you're right. I don't know why the hell I was doing it that way. So that is another limitation, if you want to call it a limitation, about the features, the product features, are they uh, com comparable between other products? If every product were to offer every feature, then we would be in a very difficult situation. So that's another, I wouldn't call it as a limitation, but it's just a, um, like a misconception about Zscaler that, oh, Zscaler cannot do this, but there is a reason behind it. Yeah, understood, understood. So just, just a quick one in terms of, you know, obviously if, if they're maximizing their capacity, how can how can Zscaler kind of like overcome that moving forward? Um, is, is, is there a possibility for, you know, the customers to increase the capacity or, yeah, is there any sort of ways around it? Yeah, so currently what they're still trying to do is they're trying to scale their data centers. Um, and add more data centers so that you add redundancy at the same time adding capacity. It takes time, but that's that's one of the ways. Now, one other smart thing Zscaler could do, could do is leverage the public cloud like AWS or Azure. They're already in there. They're already trying to create these app connectors that we talked about. They already have app connectors that could go into AWS and Azure so that they are leveraging AWS's infrastructure, not building out their own data centers or having the customers set up a virtual machine in the data center. So those are the two things that I would think, but ultimately, in my opinion, they could go something like what Netflix did. Netflix runs completely on AWS. There are no Netflix data centers. So technically Zscaler could work out something with AWS or Azure and say, hey, we need a co-location or some kind of running over the top or something like that. I'm not sure, but that's just my thought process. But currently, they're just adding capacity in terms of hardware and building more data centers to add capacity and redundancy. Understood. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we've got quite a lot of questions. Um, one that's just come in now. Uh, what are the common issues reported uh, by customers to Zscaler? Common issues reported by customers to Zscaler is that URL miscategorization. The Zscaler would say this uh, URL is not safe based on their scanning. It, they, they call it as the Zulu um, analyzer, Z-U-L-U, -U, um, URL risk analyzer. Um, so that is one of the most common issues. They say Zscaler blocked my site and so on. The second issue is latency. So they'll say, if I'm going through Washington, D.C., I'm experiencing latency. But if I'm going through Atlanta, I don't have a problem. So that is sometimes a Zscaler issue. But most, most of the times, it's based on the ISP that the customer is using and the way they are routing the traffic in their internal network that is adding to the latency. That's the second common issue. And the third common issue is I cannot access my applications in ZPA which is again a provisioning issue. So somebody who provisioned the user did not provision the proper access to that um, end user for those applications. Um, 
And how does D, uh, how does Zscaler take care of DDoS attacks? Of what attacks now? Uh, DDoS attacks. Oh, DDoS, you mean? Yeah. Um, I haven't uh, dug deep into it. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure. We will have to check their documentation. That's completely fine. Um, so there's some questions here about um, files. Will the scans be possible if there are files that are protected? And uh, does that go with zipped files also? Uh, yes, Zscaler can um, scan uh, zipped files up to certain levels of, um, uh, what do you call it, compression. Uh, but I don't think it can um, uh, scan password encrypted files. I, I don't, I'm not sure the documentation keeps changing and it's been a while. So yeah, they do support uh, zipped files encryption up to certain levels, up to certain layers, that's what they call it. And uh, there is a certain limitation of uh, they not being able to scan password protected files or something like that. Again, I think that has to do with privacy because if they scan, I don't know, I'm, I'm just saying. I'm not really completely sure on that, but they have a very good documentation on that. Okay, well, uh, we've been going for nearly an hour. I think it's probably time to uh, wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much, Ravi, for uh, your presentation and obviously for answering all the questions. Thank you, Akash, um, for being here, asking your own questions, just uh, interacting in general. And uh, everyone in the comments, thank you for your questions and um, we'll see you next time. Yes. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Akash. Thank you, West Point. This is fantastic. And uh, just as a plug or a FYI, um, Pact Publishing has a lot of cybersecurity books. I just looked at their website this morning. There are more than 200 or 500, ranging from introduction to cryptography, introduction to cybersecurity, all the way to operations and cloud security response, etc. So uh, please do check, check them out. And if you want to become an author, please let me know. I can put in a referral with my editorial team. And that way, Oscar and Akash get to interview more authors in the future. Yeah. And if anyone does have any further questions for Ravi as well, make sure you connect with him on LinkedIn. And I'm sure he'll be happy to answer any questions you may have as well. Yes. I am an open LinkedIn networker. Plus, please don't spam me. But I, I will accept your invites and I will answer your questions as we go. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Have a good day. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.